takes all kinds of critters to, to make, make Farmer Vincent, Vincent fritters. fritters. <laughs> You're eating out my heart and soul. Imagination simply contained in the mind? Or does it tap into an unseen world with messages waiting to be told? There is a place where legends cross over into our world, where strange visions and whispers beckon and superstition takes hold. Step into the Black Cat's shadow. Welcome back to the Black Cat Shadow. My name is Andy. I'm your host, podcasting from Kansas City, Missouri. And I'm Phantom Dark Dave, coming at you from the heart of Texas. With us today, a man who has been dishing out movies for quite a while. And speaking of dishing, he is responsible for directing a film where people are the main course. With various titles to his name, this podcast went crazy for the film that states, Meet, Meet, A Man's Gotta Eat. Please welcome to the show the director of Motel Hell, Mr. Kevin Connor. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, and good morning. Uh, love the love the introduction. Yeah, Dave, Dave always makes the best introductions. I, I tell you. <laughs> Maybe one day somebody will make one for me, Andy. <laughs> cough, cough. <laughs> yeah. Meat's meat, and man's got to eat. Yes, it's one of the one of our catchphrases on the uh, on on the set as well, of course. As you can imagine, uh, there, there was some uh, quite a few. Uh, uh, quotes that uh, the crew had fun with. Oh yeah, I mean in that in that movie there were so many one-liners, so many quotable quotes in that movie. It, it's great. I mean, I I can definitely see why it has a cult following. Yeah, well, it's uh, it was 1980. It's, uh, I came to America uh, early night. Yeah, early 1980, and uh, just to have a go at Hollywood because it's like Everest is there, and you you know everybody's got to have a crack at it, um, and. Uh, we were here for about two, two or three months and nothing was happening. And, oh, dear, you know, almost getting ready to go back to England because uh, it's very hard to break. Even if I'd, I'd done those uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs uh, pictures in England, it, it wasn't enough of a calling card to, um, you know, to, to, to uh, open too many doors. But I got lucky and um, somebody took me under their wing and got me a job and uh, all got me introduction to um, the the two boys that uh, were producing um, uh, Motel Hell, and uh, so up I went. Took my le- the, the um, what was the film? The <clears throat> I took the uh, Tales from Beyond the Grave. I lugged the 35 mil print up to UA and showed them the movie, and they um, they liked it. <clears throat> so I read the script, and uh, and uh, there's a story I repeat quite often. But uh, the, I got got back to the apartment and read the opening the movie fade in long shot night motel hello cut interior fat woman is in bed with a dildo and a pig now i read this and i <laughs> oh my god i said i've come all the way to america to do this kind of stuff you know and so I, but anyway i continue reading and it was a lot of fun but i you know suggested to the two boys that we make it more of a, a black comedy you know Everybody would play it straight, you know, but take out all that sort of, you know, what I call childish uh, stuff and, uh, you know, have a bit more fun, uh, raise raise the ante a little bit and, and so on. And, and they did, and, uh, and that's what you see today, uh, it, the result of that. But it was, I tell you, when I read that opening, I, I nearly packed it all in on, to go back to England, but uh, we stayed with it. Yeah, that movie has such an odd tone to it. I mean, it, it has you know a suspenseful, ominous feel, but then, you know, with Rory Calhoun and uh, you know the lady that played Ida, I forget her name, uh, they play those roles so well and so comedic. I mean, it's it, it's 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 an interesting contrast to the overall you know storyline. <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, it, it sort of was the end of an era of 
that sort of horror genre, I think, and because it became, well, you'd had, uh, um, you know, the, the, the sort of slasher type movies, um, and, and they seem to take over any subtlety anymore. Um, as I believe it's what you don't see that's horrific, and not, and not you don't you don't have to show throats being ripped open, because if you notice that you you see a knife and in, uh, in Motel Hell, you see the knife go up to the throat, but you'd never actually see it, you know, slash it or whatever. You you know what's going to happen. You don't have to show uh, the gore and so on. And you cut to something lovely like you know birds fluttering away or whatever. You know an old Hitchcock trick, of course. And um, yeah, that's uh, that's the way I approached it. I just didn't want to do a slasher type movie, but I, I guess it was the sort of end of a, a, a an approach or genre, if you like. Yeah, and we we kind of find that fascinating because you know when you look at the cover, you read the premise of the film. It seems like it's going to be intentionally graphic, and. You know, I can handle, and most of our horror audience can handle practical effects with the best of them. But what we can't handle is when the effects are done so poorly. And some artists, you know, they make decisions to not show effects because they can't afford it. But in your case, I think um, what you did manage to get more of a reaction is you just built up the tension and the fear with the scene, even though there's it's surrounded by comedy. Like you said, you know, you see the the long shot of the knife coming from one room to another, you know what you're setting it up. You don't right. have to show, you know, blood splattering and everything like that. I don't enjoy those because it's, to me, it's, that's not very creative or particularly clever. Um, I think the other way is, is much smarter and film like, if you, if you like, um, than to show that stuff. But yeah, that's the way we wanted to approach it. And, um, as I suppose the original script didn't have a, a lot of, uh, you know, slashing and blood and thing everywhere. Yeah, it's what you don't see. That uh, you watch any Hitchcock film, you, you know, you very, you, I can't think you, you never see uh, stuff like that. You know, it, 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 throat cutting and blood everywhere and so on. I mean, the the famous shower scene. Actually, you don't see anything. You think you do, but you don't. You know. Yeah, and you know, speaking of it, since we're saying Hitch, do you have a favorite Hitchcock film? Um, uh, do you know? I think uh, the um, <clears throat> well, but Vertigo, I, I think. But uh, which my well, of course, Psycho it was it was terrific. Um, that, I would think that's one of my favorites, Psycho. Yeah, I think most uh, people would agree. It was black and white, and I love black and white movies. But uh, no, I remember seeing that. A Family Plot. Very underrated, right? Yes. That was one of his later films. Yeah, see, I'm a little passionate towards uh, Rope. I think Rope was my favorite because it was such a menacing story, but kind of like yours, it even had a little humor surrounding it, and it shows yeah. nothing, you know, yeah. but it's a terrifying idea. <laughs> yeah, no, that was the end uh, of um, uh, Rear Window, of course, I thought was terrific. Yeah. Well, anything with Jimmy Stewart in it. Is, That's what uh, I was going to say. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's funny, too, because I wonder what Motel Hell would look like as a black and white film. Um, would that work, Andy? Yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah. I don't okay. See We're going to have to figure out how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> They've tried to remake it several times, and I think uh, one of the, the boys, um, uh, Charles or Stevens, wants to direct it, I think. But, but I've not heard of it um, actually going into production at all yet. Yeah. Something I found fascinating, too, is, you know, if you're going to compare this movie to another movie around the same time, you know, Toby Hooper had Texas Chainsaw Massacre out, and that's another movie that does the same aspect. It doesn't have the comedy that yours has, but, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily show all the extreme graphics. It just hints that they're there. But then no, but in your movie, um, there's a huge climatic scene at the end where there's a chainsaw sequence that later inspires, rumor has it, Texas Chainsaw Massacre too, so I think it's a fascinating circle. Oh yes, uh, maybe I, I I don't know that it did, um, uh, but yeah, but, but so many stories you know come out of uh, out of a movie, and you get asked questions. You think, well, I didn't really intend that. It just it just so happened we only had half an hour to shoot, and that's the only way we could do it to to, to finish the day's work. You know, it's, there's always a a reason why things happened. Um, uh, you'd like to think you plan everything, but you know, one, the, the film, 
once you hit the set, it takes on its own life. And you know, when you get the actors, they they input all their uh, their thoughts and so on, and the film sort of you know moves in in a different direction. But uh, um, yeah, I saw uh, Chain, Chainsaw Massacre in England, and I thought that it was pretty terrifying. I must say, it was pretty. I thought he did a, a terrific job, uh, Toby, and uh, um, but it changed. I thought I changed the way. Um, the the, the the horror films um, went over the next uh, decade or so. Um, yeah, he he was he certainly moved it, moved the moved the bar. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and you know, and you can see that that movie inspired some. Yeah, so many of those movies that came bef- came after it. Um, was there any particular? Uh, inspiration behind the story of Farmer Vincent? Or do you know if the writers, uh, I guess, molded the story after a particular, uh, like, serial killer or something like that, or was it just a completely original idea? I think, I think as far as I know, it was totally their original idea. Um, I think there have been some claims that uh, a script like that had been floating around um, the same sort of idea, uh, but as far as I knew, I mean, they handed me the script, uh, which we then revised and worked on for a f- several weeks before we went into production. But um, I, I never asked them where they got the idea from, or, or whether they had. Well, they couldn't have optioned it because they had the uh, they had the only credits on it. So um, anyway, uh, no, I, I don't know where they got it from, but uh, it's very bizarre, I must say. Um, but uh, it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun, as you can imagine, uh, shooting that. Oh yeah, I mean, you could tell that. Yeah, it, it was. You could tell people were having fun, and uh, you know, with the comedic aspects, like I, it's not one of those movies where the com- the comedy's in your face. It's you know, like you said, it's like a black comedy where it's a little bit more understated. It's in, and it's not one of those like laugh out loud movies. Although I will say, at the very end. Well, when, you know, at the very end, Farmer Vincent's last line was hilarious and it had me in stitches. Yes. You, know, you know, I use yeah. Pre- you know, preservatives, you know, because you think he's going to say yeah. one thing, but then he says something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that was a, they, no, that, the boys came up with that. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, I've got the original script somewhere. Um, uh, I, I got it bound, I think, somewhere. But uh, yeah, yes, I think the boys put that, that, uh, that that one in, that was a, that was a nice cap. Always got a big laugh. Yeah. So, uh, Kevin, when when you when you first decided you wanted to be in the film industry, did you say, "Hey, I want to be a director right away," or did you just kind of like say, "How how can I get my foot in the door?" Uh, well, um, we had a, a, a sort of we had an art class at school and back in England and. Um, Every month there was a, 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 a sort of little flyer on the on the uh, sort of um, on the project board, and every month there was this thing from about films. And um, you know, one had never thought you could actually get a job in films or work in films, and it just never occurred to me. But uh, every month there was a very interesting, mainly from about Ealing Studios, because they were the most prolific studio at the time, making those wonderful comedies, and. Um, there was always like photographs of cranes, you know, guys on cameras on cranes and stuff. And I thought, well, that looks great, sort of to be up there and stuff. So that's that's what sort of triggered me off. And uh, but the the thing that actually finally did. Now I'm going back a few years. I'm afraid to like in the early fifties, um, still at school, and I lived out in the Hertfordshire countryside. And during the war, they'd built an American hospital. Uh, near me in the countryside, near my little house, my parents' house. And um, I used to get friendly with the American guys and uh, who were coming back from the D-Day landings. They, 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 we got bananas and sweets and stuff, which we hadn't, we'd never seen. Anyway, dissolve several years later, and the Americans gone back, and there's places covered in brambles and whatever. And one night, there's a big glow of light coming from this... American hospital where it used to be so I cycled down and they're making a movie and they turned this American hospital into Auschwitz I couldn't believe it I mean it's just magic and I was I don't know 14 or something by then and uh, there was all these guards and dogs and people trundling into thing and uh, in, into the under, into the gates and so on and it was just a magical moment 
and that's really what um, you know triggered me. Because a film set at night is is, is just for me magic, um, and so on. Anyway, that's really how I got uh, you know uh, hooked it hooked. And I live quite near the MGM Studios in Boreham Wood. With uh, we 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 would uh, drive past and see um, uh, the hillside was covered in castles. I think they were making like Elizabeth Taylor. Knights of the Round Table, the Black Prince, all that kind of stuff yeah, in those days. So it was kind of around me, a lot of it. Yeah, so that's that's how I got uh, got into it, or got really hooked. Um, and as I said, I, wrote, I, said I, I, say, I wrote all these uh, uh, letters to film companies and eventually got in the, the cutting rooms in 1953. Yes, quite a few years ago. Speaking of the 50s... Um... In this movie, something I found fascinating was the scene where it focuses on the monster that challenged the world. Because I'm a fan of the older creature features and the monster movies and the radioactive things. And I just, I loved getting to see that little clip because it takes you back for a few minutes. Um, did, did you, I know we talked about Alfred Hitchcock films, but do you favor any of the older monster pictures? Um, do you know, I, I mean, I wasn't really a great uh, follow. I mean, I, Saw a lot of um, that time. Um, so obviously, a lot of American films were coming over, um, but the the Ealing comedies and uh, the Rank Organization were, were churning out rather kind of boring films at the time. That sort of bit behind the times. But uh, I can't say I particularly. I mean, I, there were Saturday morning movies, a lot of westerns and things, you know, American westerns and. Uh, and, and so on, but I can't say I particularly followed. Uh, um, I mean, yeah, I was trying to try to think anything specific, but uh, War of the Worlds. Um, um, what was the George Powell film Go to the Moon uh, and stuff like that? Science fiction uh, uh, type of movies I enjoyed. I can't say I specifically went after horror films uh, per se. I don't think. I mean, there was the Hammer. Some of the Hammer things which were being made, <clears throat> Hammer horror, you know. Um, Absolutely, and you talk about George Power. Is it Time Machine that you're thinking about? It was a, a Destination Moon? Destination Moon? Oh, okay. Like yeah, really? Yeah. yeah, it was one of the first uh, of that genre. Um, I was trying to rack my brains about any horror films I might have seen, but I, uh, that, that I actually, you know, followed. And, and so, sure. So horror wasn't exactly um, my uh, my uh, great interest in in movies, I must say. You said you live close to the MGM studios, and when I think of MGM, I always think about the pictures they did from the 30s through the 60s, with the musicals. I was actually, uh, I know I do a horror podcast, but a big fan of the musicals as well. Yeah, but they but they, they were mainly here, weren't they, in Los Angeles? Uh, they, oh, absolutely. Gene Kelly made, uh, the, when he did that dance, uh, the final, after the success of uh, American in Paris and so on, he did do a purely sort of electric uh, feature film at this MGM Studios um, in, in, in Boreham Wood. I can't think of the title of it, but yeah, they did. They they made quite a lot of big, big movies at the time, and then I think Kirk Kerkorian sold it off uh, in the depression of the 60s, I guess. Yeah, the late 60s, and became a, fr a refrigerator factory or something, sadly. It was a beautiful studio, you know, designed by the MGM uh, people, a proper studio. It, was, it wasn't, you know, a collection of warehouses. Anyway, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, the, the whole the whole side of the hill was covered with, uh, you know, uh, castles and moats and things. It was really, uh, you, you know, you just step into another world. It was um, very, it was life changing for me. Anyway, it got me, it got me going, and I've stuck with it ever since. <laughs> A lot of people don't know what they want to do, and I, it, you know, like 12 or 13, I knew what I wanted to do, so it really saved a lot of time messing about, you know, as a teenager, wondering where, which direction to go. Yeah, no doubt. I like living amongst all that would definitely like inspire anybody to want to be in that, you know, in that business. I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I noticed that uh, you know one of your earlier movies uh, before Motel Hill, back in the 70s. Uh, you did do quite a few like science fiction type uh, movies and, and and horror, and one that sticks out for me is uh, from Beyond the Grave. Uh, you know, you have yeah. yeah, yeah, you got to work with Peter Cushing and 
Donald Pleasance in that one? Yeah, that was quite a cast, I must say. And that was my break. I was uh, Amicus uh, Films, which I'm sure you've heard of, um, Milton Sabotsky and, uh, and and so on. And they, they were sort of the Hammer type of um, uh, equivalent, probably not so prolific, but um, they made a whole series of these... Um, compilation type films you know with like four short stories put together and then a you know with a link story and so on and uh you know up to that point i've been an editor and doing a, two or three you know quite big movies and so on but got a bit bored with it and um wanted to sort of push on as it were and um i collected a lot of short stories and optioned them and with the two two friends we created uh, like a series of half hour short stories for television that was the idea. Anyway, they ended up on Milton Sabotsky's desk, who was uh, chairman of uh, Amicus, and uh, uh, he called called me in uh, with my agent and said, uh, "I'm going to take four of these stories and make a link story, and you can you can direct it." And I said, well, "I've never directed before. Don't worry." Said editors make good directors, uh, certainly efficient um, directors, because you know when you've got a performance or what you need. To, speed things up and cover it and so on and so forth. So um, he said, I'll surround you with some of the best technicians I can and uh, we, we can afford. And he did. I had Alan Hume, a terrific DP and a great operator, Derek Brown and wonderful art director, Maurice Carter. And then he gave me all these wonderful actors, uh, you know, because you only needed them like for four days. So you could get, I got, you know, David Warner and uh, uh, Donald Pleasance and uh, Angela Pleasance and, uh, uh, Ian Bannon, Ian Carmichael, you know, Margaret Leighton. I mean, talk about going back to the 30s and 40s, a wonderful, uh, you know, really, really terrific, uh, Leslie Ann Down, and um, you know, really good, 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 uh, good actors. And of course, being an editor, you do you come across good actors when you're editing. You can see, you know, who's got it, who hasn't got it, and who you have to work on, and so on. So, uh, yeah, it was. Um, it was a great break, and uh, I'm forever thankful for for Milton for giving me the break. Yeah, I mean that, and that you know, having the cast like that, working with you know those talented people, it must have made your job all that much easier, especially being your first movie. <laughs> of course, and they're, they're all really nice people and uh, uh, very kind, and uh, uh, you know, especially Cushing. He was so uh, he's a real, real English gentleman, and uh, you know, he always wore <clears throat> white gloves when he between takes he always wore these white gloves because he's a great smoker because of the nicotine the nicotine stains on his fingers you know he didn't want that but the, the gloves he wore were like in the editing room you had these white cotton gloves in those days uh so you didn't get you didn't you know mark the film with sweaty fingers and all that stuff and uh, whatever um yes he always had these cutting room white cutting room gloves on in between takes smoking away but he was really good, and he really uh, helped me and encouraged me, and uh, became a great friend of the families. Yeah, and speaking of being an editor, that's that's got to be like putting together a huge jigsaw puzzle, right? It's like you have all these scenes and trying to put them together to make a a story. Well, if it's yeah, if it's it's got to be on the page. If it ain't on the page, what do they say? If it ain't on the page, it's not on the screen or whatever. Um, yeah, I um, but I do prepare quite thoroughly and uh, um, know exactly what I want and. I was going to go together and, and make sure I got the cover so you can speed the scene up and uh, and so on. But you know these they're so professional. These this, the the caliber of actors I had that they did make life easy. You know you, you know I had a, I had sort of a, I I wasn't brought up in the theatre per se or, or dealing with actors except you know through the cutting rooms when you did ADR and stuff like that. Um, but really they were just. Um, uh, it, it made my life very easy. And it was it. Somebody said, "Always get good actors, and then the the rest uh, you know, makes life a little bit easier for you because they bring they bring the, their craft to it, which is what it's all about." Speaking of good actors, um, post Motel Hell, which is 1980, you have a laundry list of things you participated in, which includes um, a lot of miniseries and made-for-TV movies and television shows. I noticed you directed an episode of Remington Steel, so you got to work with Pierce Brosnan. I bet that was a good time. 
Yes, that's right. Uh, we, um, that's when I came to America. Um, I did those couple of um, because of um, uh, the um, the the uh, from beyond the grave. Milton and Amicus Films gave me a, a three. I did three of those uh, Edgar Rice Barrows things. Um, people that time forgot, land that time forgot, and at the Earth's core. Then, then it was kind of after that. Then I came to America, and then. I got sidetracked in after Motel Hell. Got sidetracked into uh, television miniseries. I got uh, um, North and South, the second North and South, which is a like eleven, twelve hour series. Um, uh, so that was, you know, put you put you up in a sort of bracket. And um, but I did, you know, Heart to Hearts and uh, uh, as you say, Remington Steel with with Brosnan and um, Hotel. You know, I went through the mill doing those uh, seven-day shoots, which, you know, awakened me to American television and the speed of American TV and uh, and so on. And you, boy, you've got to be prepared to do that, to do that stuff in that time, because um, it, it it moves at uh, you know, seven pages, eight pages a day, sometimes more. Um, so it was good. To, it was a good uh, good to be thrown into that as well. Yeah, and you know, you had mentioned about how MGM was filming things with uh, Elizabeth Taylor and whatnot. And in '95, you did a Elizabeth Taylor story, right? The Liz Taylor story, yes, that was a, a good piece for the, that um, lovely actress uh, from um, from uh, from. Uh, oh, my brain's going at the moment. So, Twin Peaks, um, and yeah, that's right. Twin Peaks, very good. Yeah. My points, team. Hey. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, um, yes, that was that was interesting. Uh, we were trying to get the producer was trying to woo Liz Taylor to be more more cooperative and more and get behind it and help the publicity. But uh, she doesn't want she didn't want to know and uh, but she thinks she wanted paying. Basically, was uh, was behind her thing. But uh, um, no, she she didn't um, help at all in terms of publicity. Or, I mean, I think the actress tried to get in in touch with Elizabeth to get some, you know, just to get some hints and things. But no, that wasn't to be. Uh, yes, um, that, that was that was all shot here and around uh, L.A. and uh, went through a lot of the old studios and stuff. Um, that was really good. And some yeah. good actors in too. Speaking of that particular movie and more good actors, because it seems like you, we could keep playing this game all day of people you've got to work with. In, in the Liz Taylor story, you worked with uh, Angus McFadden, who was your was it your Blackbeard character? That's right. You played Blackbeard. Many yes, that was a big gap um, but, uh, between between the, that must have been ten twelve years. Yeah, no, he was terrific as he played Burton uh, in the Liz Taylor story and really very good and had the voice and uh, and so on. Yeah, then we had a great adventure in Thailand doing the um, Blackbeard. Yeah, I sort of got side, not sidetracked, but, you know, miniseries are, are really a, a great, what's the way, the, the, you're allowed, you can, you've got more time to do more story in the miniseries, you know, three hours or whatever, um, whereas a feature film, you usually got to squish it into an hour and a half or up to two hours. Um, so you can, you can, you can expand everything. Everything can be, and you, you get pretty good budgets on those as well. There's no reason why you you can't have good production. I mean, on the Thailand, uh, the uh, Blackbeard it was a fantastic uh, location we had out there, and uh, you know we could. Uh, in fact, we never. Funnily enough, we never went to sea, but we built his boat on land. Built the, boat, built the ship on land. You know, a lot of degrees. It had a 360 degrees green screen. You know, uh, around the. Um, Around the boat, so uh, and because of CGI and so on, it's amazing what you can do. And it wasn't, it wasn't that expensive in the end. At the end of the day, yes, that was a, that was an adventure. And of course, we had uh, Jessica Chastain in that movie yep. too. Yeah, she's, uh, yeah, she's done quite well for herself now. Yeah, she she's just fantastic. She was a delight to work with. And of course, that was early days uh, uh, when we did that. Um, very early days, but uh, boy, she she rocked it to fame and, and well deserved. And she picks her material so well, and uh, what she does, and it's it's a good lesson to to learn uh, from uh, up and coming actors. What was it like to be able to work on a miniseries based around Frankenstein? 
That was, you know, that's one of my favourite uh, miniseries. It was a very good script. Um, I, I don't know, you probably read the book, but it, the book does meander all over the place, and the, and the ending is, you know, goes on and on and on and on. Um, but uh, they did a, a very good job. Um, a lovely writer, um, what was his name now? Um, can't remember his name. So Mark Frey. Kruger. Mark Kruger, absolutely, that's right. Mark did a, he did a terrific job, and very close to the book. And you know, we shot this in um, in, uh, in Czechoslovakia in Bratislava, and um, well, Czech not is that Czech Republic. I can't remember now, but anyway, it's it's, it's, it's in Bratislava. And we had a lot of Russian, old Russian uh, technicians left over from the communist days who had been in the business forever making documentaries and, and, and movies for propaganda and so on. And they were fantastic. They, you know, there's a skill in their, their, their artistry and so on. And they, the set of the actual, you know, set the when, when we electrified uh, uh, the, the creature... Uh, it, it was beautiful. I mean, they, they really, um, <laughs> they were all <laughs> vodka alcoholics, most of them, but uh, really, uh, I, I must say, um, I, I was just knocked out. We were in this old Soviet-type, um, Soviet-built studio, must have built, built during the war, of, you know, for propaganda reasons or whatever. Yeah, but uh, it was, um, that was a great experience. And again, a, a, very, a very good cast. It's very lucky with uh, uh, the, all the actors and, and, the D, and the DP, great DP, Alan Kay. So. Yeah, and you know, since then, you've put out still a gazillion amount of made-for-TV films. And I've noticed you know, you've done quite a bit of Christmas movies, um, you know, complete opposite from horror, which is fine. I was just curious. Now, is this something where a job's a job, you just enjoy well, doing it, or do you have a passion for you know, the Christmas stuff? No, not particularly, to be honest. Um, <laughs> it, you, get to, you get to a point in your career when you get to a certain age and it all, you know, st- other people are coming up behind you and things change. And uh, so, in the company that I made all those uh, films for, the Larry Levinson company, they uh, they had made, um, uh, they made uh, the, the Blackbeard and uh, uh, Frankenstein. And they had a, their studio out in Simi Valley, and they turn, they shoot a lot of these um, hallmark lifetime genre, uh, family entertainment, shall we say. And so I tended to get quite a few of those, two or three a year. Um, and they did, we had a great series, uh, McBride, they did, and they did some really good stuff. But I just love doing, I just love being behind the camera and directing and stuff. And it's, you know, the studio's only a 30 minute drive and, you know, you come home every night. So, um, you know, you get to a point in your career where it's uh, it's very nice to be still be working and, and, and doing those good, good little stories. And a lot of people see these things. It's amazing. And you get good cast, you know, it's um, so I, I, I'm not, not knocking it, but it's uh, you still keep your hand in. You still meet, uh, you know. I mean, the mechanics of making a film, directing is directing, but it's still you still go through the process of meeting. It's a, it's a new story, it's a new actors you you meet all the time, and then and, and so on and so forth. So, no, I don't. Uh, it's um, it's 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 been very useful, and I still do do them now and then, and uh, keep keep at it because it's it's a great job, best job in the world actually, was it? Orson Welles best toy train in the world yeah i guess it can't be too bad of a job if you've been doing it as long as you have right yes i've been a few years <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i'm still at it i'm not giving up yet yeah i was looking at that you have quite a few films still coming out do you want to talk about any of them well they're all they're mainly um two or three of them of uh, scripts that get sent to me and they're independent films. And of course it's a nightmare trying to raise money for independent films these days, uh, unless you've got big names attached and, you, you know, I'm sure you've heard the stories. Um, but to, to the very gates is a Holocaust uh, film and a very good script um, by a writer, an English writer. And it's about a, a, a woman, a true story uh, who is taken from Bordeaux and a Catholic woman, um, the son and the husband and everything, 
and the Germans take her out of, of Bordeaux, put her on a train, accusing her of being Jewish, and her, uh, her father is Jewish, but not her mother. And she is the only woman to have been taken out of a gas chamber. Literally, the gas chamber was unlocked and she was pulled out by the German at the, at the end of the story. Um, so that's a, that's a terrific uh, piece that we're, we're trying to raise money for. Um, Connemara Days is a is a script I've had with a friend of mine for 10 years. It's about the, the making of The Quiet Man, about two kids who are extras in the, in the film of, Con of, uh, of uh, The Quiet Man and their adventures. Uh, a very sweet, you know, charming story, a sort of a nod to an, an iconic film, because John Ford is one of my favourite uh, directors. And um, I've just written a screenplay, um, uh, adapted a screenplay from a book, uh, set in Louisiana. I'm trying to get that going, trying to attract, uh, you know, financed, uh, viable, financial viable names. Um, and a rom-com thing I'm writing. You know, you just have to keep, you just have to keep keep going and keep um, finding interesting things to keep your brain going. Otherwise, you just uh, you just uh, fade away, and we don't want to do. It. No, it's it's. Uh, no, I, I love it still. So I'm still still pretty active. Yeah, I mean, it's always a good feeling when you can keep working and, and, you know, even if, you know, you're, it's more like independent stuff or whatever, it's, you still get to do, you know, what you love and people may, you know, look at TV, you know, working at TV and movie is two different things. And I think, you know, with the, the miniseries, you know, that, that seems more appealing because you get more time to develop your story, like you said, and, uh, you know, with the movies, sometimes things can be rushed and try to, you know, edit it towards, uh, you know, squash down to like an hour and a half or whatever, you know, where there's a lot more. And, uh, you know, I've, I mean, but I've, you know, I've been all over the world doing these miniseries to Africa, to, uh, to India, Japan. And, uh, um, it's, it's been, it's been terrific. Uh, um, whereas that sometime maybe with features, uh, one wouldn't have done such a, a vast array of, uh, of subject matter. Uh, shall we say? Um, uh, you know, funny enough, I've not been offered any sort of horror uh, films or anything. They've not come my way at all. Um, I do. We have got one that we're working on at the moment um, called uh, Mortuary Girl, which is a is, is, is a is, is a is a good is, is a fun again a fun dark piece. Um, yeah, it, it's a. Um, I would, I would have thought maybe a few more horror films would have come my way or offers, but they but they never did. It mainly, as I say, in these international sort of miniseries, or where you go to places the back of beyond, where you you know have to use local crew, and uh, you know they're, 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 it's more far more interesting, well, you know, because you get to see meet the local people. You go to places that you wouldn't go as a tourist, and you go into uh, houses and palaces, and you know you really see uh, a lot of the world than if you stayed here all the time. Well, I feel like with Mortuary Girl, you already have the name going for you. Yeah, it's a good name, isn't it? It's a good name, and it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, uh, but we pushed it around, but uh, you know, no no takers yet. But uh, you just you just have to keep at it because you 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 never know where the interest is going to come from or where that that bite or that uh, you know they're not it's not expensive. It's probably two and a half million dollars or something you know you've got to it has to be down at a certain uh, budget level uh, these days I and mean, i think you're asking me about when i what horror films i was interested in or monster type films prior to doing my first one um and i think i sort of sort of uh, fell into into fell into the horror genre uh, because it is a lot of fun and you can do things that uh, you 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 can you can do that you can't do in a sort of normal feature film. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, I did I did several Dickens pieces for for Disney and so on, and and they are a lot of fun too because you it's period, and again when you go into period, uh, it's it's just a more magical, um, interesting. The, the visuals are, are far more demanding or more far more a lot more fun to to have to deal with and, uh, and, and show and carry the, the way they dress the way they speak and and so on um so i've uh, yes i've done more period stuff horror genre you know that sort of um that look which is more cinematic shall we say sure um, 
than normal. So that's that's where how I ended up there, I guess. Um, and also, you get, uh, horror films are usually a break. That's how you get your break uh, is by doing a low budget horror film uh, to get into the industry. <laughs> you usually have to do one of those to get um, to, to get a foot in the door, and, and you just hope and pray that it's a little bit different to uh, to other horror films that, that it gets a bit of interest. Well, Motel Hell was definitely different. And I have to ask, you know, you talked about the idea of still being open to do some horror pictures in the future. Certain people have tried to come at, you know, around the corner with remakes. Have you ever considered the idea of directing a remake for Motel Hell? Uh, I did. I think I said earlier, I think I did um, touch base. I had heard rumors that they want, that it was going to be remade. Um, I did touch base with uh, the Jaffe, um, Charles Jaffe, um, one of the producers, and the word came back from him that uh, he he was hoping to be to direct it, um, and so on. But that was a couple of years ago, and uh, it's all, it's all been very quiet. I've never seen any announcements uh, for it. Um, I don't know. It's kind of strange in your own lifetime to be remaking films that you shot that you you shot only like 30 years ago or something. Um, but they did remake um, People That... Was it a lot of Land That Time Forgot? That was remade. Um, but I didn't see it. But I, I don't know that I'd like to go to repeat what you did. I think it leave it to somebody else. I'd rather do something different. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, it's interesting, Kevin, that you say that. You know, people have to start out in horror to get their foot in the door. And, I mean, for us horror fans, it would, it would be... That's like the pinnacle of of what we would want to do in the film industry is to actually do horror movies. So that's, that's interesting that, you know, act, you know, you see it all the time, actors and actresses, they, you know, the ones that are famous now, you know, you can go back to the start of their career and see what their first movie is. And sure enough, it's probably a horror movie. I mean, you know, look at Kevin that's Bacon, right. you know, look at George Clooney, even, you know, people like that, you know, they got their start in horror and it's, and it's kind of sad yeah. that like, they don't, that people don't stick with it, that, they see it as like a stepping stone or something like that. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm no. I've also written a um, adapted a fantasy film, you know, and and stuff like that. But it's again, it's very hard to uh, to to you know, independent to, to get your own stuff going. I mean, I was lucky in um, England that uh, you know we were sort of on our own. We could. You know, I could edit the way I had. I could, I could have the whatever composer and all. I had, I had all the choices. You know, um, as films should be made. You know, the director almost has final cut. And I kind of did have final cut um, because we were uh, with John, Johnny Dark, and Milton Sabotsky. We were partners, so uh, there was no one. There was never a big problem. You know, and we arrived at uh, the, the final cut amicably, and uh, that was that. But you know, there's so many people with fingers in the pie today it's it's really difficult to get the director to get his there's very few that get that final cut you know but you know the standard of tv and writing and photography and acting is so good today as well it's it's really it's really feature quality um, but uh no i encourage uh keep uh, so you guys you want to you want to make a horror film have you written horror films have you written scripts that's a that's an interesting question because the answer is yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> How are you getting on? Um, about the same as you said when you said getting funding can be a pain. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 really tough. Yeah, and so uh, do you, do you write together? Uh, no, I I pretty much am a writer. Um, yeah. Andy is more of a music guy. Oh right, okay. Well, that's, but uh, that's, so you got, you got, there's the team already. You know, that's... writer, director, and the composer. There you are. Um, but you, but you've just got to keep keep at it. You know, some it'll land somewhere. I mean, that's what happened in my script. It just landed on someone's desk somewhere, and somebody picked it up and read it, and you know, and off you go. Uh, you you just got to find that producer that likes what you've done and and gets it, and understands it. Uh, and uh, then you're off and running. You know? <laughs> so, but boy, uh, you 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 just got to, as I say, if you want it bad enough, you, you'll you'll uh, it'll happen. So so keep at it. 
really. Absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, I thought maybe I should just give a Motel Hell an, another rewrite there, but, you know, hey. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I don't, I, it's a bit too gentle these days, I think. In, in You know, when I say gentle, um, the, I mean, the undertones are pretty grim, but uh, the actual visuals are... Yeah, uh, it's compared with what you see today. It's it's a very gentle film. You know, something else, Kevin, I found fascinating, and um, I'm sure you did too, is, you know, your movie managed to take the cover of Fangoria Number no. 9, which I actually own. Oh, do you? And it has uh, He Knows You're Alone kind of in one of the spaces too, which is another film I love. All right, Kevin, before we let you go, is there anything else you would like to say? Uh, yes, I'd just like to uh, reach out to Hope Madden, and uh, I gather that she... Uh, got her interest in uh, in uh, horror films and the genre uh, when she uh, was sneaking a look at a, uh, a cable run of Motel Hell uh, a few years ago. And uh, I'm really uh, delighted that uh, I had a little um, helped somebody uh, get an interest and uh, uh, in, into this genre of, of movie making, which is a lot of fun, and uh, and uh, hope uh, I'm delighted. You, I'm so glad that you enjoyed it, and uh, uh, keep writing, keep writing. That's the key. Thank you guys for tuning into this episode. We really appreciate it. And that Hellraiser franchise overview is still going to come out at some point. We just got to get it recorded. And with all the holiday activities, it just didn't happen. So thanks for uh, thanks for you guys' patience. We will get that out for you. Not exactly sure what we're going to be doing for January. We got some stuff ready. So we just have to figure out what we're going to release first. And so stay tuned for all that. And as always, you can find us out there on social media. On Twitter, we are at Black Cat Podcast. You can find Phantom Dark Dave at Phantom Dark Dave. And also, uh, Phantom Dark Dave is going to be putting out a new podcast of his own. And it's going to be called Dave's Pop Culture Podcast. So be sure to stay tuned uh, for how you can tune into that. He's going to be talking about all kinds of pop culture stuff, uh, subjects like from comic books, movies, books, uh, cartoons. So definitely stay tuned for that. Um, I'm excited for him to start putting out episodes on that. And you can also find us on Facebook. Uh, just search for Black Hat Shadow. And you can find us on Horror Amino as well. And you can always send us an email. Uh, any comments or uh, questions or anything like that. Send us an email at blackhatpodcast at gmail.com. And you can also, if you'd like to talk to Dakota, send him an email. Send him a shout out. He would appreciate it. You can send him one at dakshadowbane at gmail.com. That's D-A-K-S-H-A-D-O-W-B-A-N-E at gmail.com. Also, you can visit our website at www.blackcatshadow.com where you'll find all of our past episodes where you can listen to them directly from the website or you'll find all the links to download them and listen to them whenever you'd like. You'll also find the links to our YouTube channel and our eBay movie store. So go check those out. Uh, got lots of cool stuff in the movie store. Here that the holidays are over, I'm going to try to catch up and get some more. I've got a lot of stuff to put on there, so I'm going to get caught up with that. So so definitely come back on a regular basis because uh, I'm just adding new inventory all the time. That'll do it for us, guys. So remember, you know, once again, to take a closer look at the world around you, and you may just find that it is stranger and more mysterious than you thought, especially in the Black Cat Shadow. 